All right, so welcome everybody at the Flow Seminar, where Flow stands for Federated Learning One Word Seminar. And this was a seminar created by Peter, who is also our uh, speaker today. Uh, myself, Virginia Smith, Aurelian Bellet, then Alistair. Also later we had Sebastian uh, Stig joining. So Federated Learning One Word Seminar was created to provide the online <coughs> forum for the dissemination of latest scientific research results in all aspects of Federated Learning. And today is my great pleasure to introduce you our speakers. I already mentioned one of the organizers, uh, Peter Ihtari, who is a professor of computer science at KAUST, uh, where he leads the optimization and machine learning team. And throughout his work on randomized and distributed algorithm, <coughs> algorithms, he has contributed to the foundations of optimization, machine learning, and also in particular, federated learning, as he's one of the original contributors to federated learning. And today he's going to tell us on a very recent work on the fifth generation of local training methods in the learning. So thank you, Peter. Please, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Samuel. And hello, everybody. Uh, so I kind of self-invited myself to give a talk here at Flow as well. I've given uh, one version or another of this talk already multiple times in various forums, but uh, it was always a closed audience. Uh, uh, so, for instance, last time I gave this talk to, to Apple, but uh, some people were interested in joining, but uh, this was a closed talk to Apple only. I gave a, sh I, I gave a short version uh, some time ago to Google, and the talk is also evolving, so the slides are not the same as they used to be. Uh, and I want what, what I want to share with you is uh, some sort of a backward look at what has been happening in the area of federal learning, which has to do with local training. So federal learning is a very wide field, obviously, and there's certain mechanism called local training, or at least I call it local training, uh, which uh, has been not understood and remains to, to be interesting a mechanism to be studied. So I'll, I'll go through, uh, through the explanation of all of this, what it means. If you have, haven't heard of it, you'll, you'll get to hear about it here in this talk, so there's no prior knowledge really necessary. Now I have material here for quite some time, so I could even speak for two hours, depends on how much interaction I'm going to get. Uh, so if there's very little interaction, it'll be faster, but if there's a lot of interaction, then uh, feel free to allocate more time here. I'm not going to be kicking anybody out, and hopefully Samuel will not kick me out after an hour, but of course, if you have some prior uh, things to do then then uh, you know, flow seminar is really just sort of our our fifteen tops. Okay, so so this is uh, not a talk about a single paper. It's a talk about uh, multiple papers. Even though I'm not really going to talk about almost any of these, I'm going to give some kind of a big overview, and then I have a little bit of of uh, about one, a little bit of uh, about another one, and so on. And this is John work with some really fantastic uh, co-authors. Uh, I hope all of them are here on the slide. If not, uh, I need to I need to double check, triple check. Uh, most of them are either former members of my team or current members of my team. I think the only exception here is Sebastian, who is external collaborator. Uh, so what I'll talk about, I'll first explain what I mean by local training. And I, I hope, uh, I believe that many of you know this, but I'm not going to assume that you know. And if, and if you do, I want to explain exactly what I mean. And then I go through this brief history of local training from a certain vantage point. So this is not history of everything that's happened, but it's some sort of an attempt at classification of, of what we knew at what time about this phenomenon. And this allows me to talk about the fifth generation of local training methods, which is the latest generation, and uh, and what this means, uh, what those results are, and, and, and what kinds of results do we have, and uh, what flavor, and so on and so forth, and what is still known and unknown. Uh, so local training, first let's, uh, let's just formalize the problem we're going to talk about. And uh, there's many ways you could formalize this. And I'm going to use this simplest possible one, which is just the standard optimization formulation of fair learning. It may not look standard because typically what you see is weighted average where the weight uh, counts the number of data points on each client. However, mathematically, this is really the same formulation. I'm you, you can just imagine you're hiding the weight here within the function fi. 
and then you have you can turn any weighted average into just standard uniform average uh, so to speak <laughs> so notably i'm not going to uh, assume at least for the fifth generation and even even maybe fourth and third any kind of uh any kind of uh, level or degree of similarity uh, across the data sets so they could be arbitrarily heterogeneous which is not very uh, typical in most of the literature because heterogeneity uh, is and remains to some degree uh, a big problem in fairy learning so n is the number of machines or devices think of phones let's say you have millions of them d is the number of parameters this could be even larger than n because we work with uh, over parameterized models typically so both both n and d are a challenge however I, I, i'm going to focus on d being the challenge not on n being the challenge in this talk uh, why is that a challenge so let's first come up with the simplest possible algorithm we can think of for uh, solving this problem so let me click on chat i can see something ah this is just samuel saying something there all right hi okay so the the simplest possible algorithm we can think of is gradient descent and we'll give this uh, named distributed gradient descent, even though it's just gradient descent implemented in a distributed environment. Uh, and I'm going to describe it uh, on the example of three workers. We have three functions, F1, F2, F3. We want to minimize the average of these three functions. We have a server. These workers need to communicate somehow, and the way they'll communicate is through some uh, orchestrating server. So in, in distributed gradient descent, all the workers first start with the same uh, copy of, of parameters of a model. So let's call this XT at iteration T. They will create a copy of that copy. So, uh, okay, this is just for, for notation purposes. Obviously, you will not copy from memory into another piece of memory, the same vector. You'll work in memory. And you take one gradient step using the local data. So notice that here I'm taking gradient with respect to F1, here I'm taking gradient with respect to F2, and here I'm taking gradient with respect to F3. And essentially, this is one gradient step taken by each worker, assuming that the worker just wants to minimize its local function fi and nothing else. So that's really what's going on here. However, after one step, we immediately stop the process and send the resulting uh, parameters to the server, and the server averages them. That's it. And if you just do the algebra here, which is very simple, just substitute into this uh, yellow or orangish uh, kind of a box. Uh, the formulas that you see above, what you get is just all standard gradient descent methods. So xt minus step size gamma times gradient of f at xt. Okay, so this is just a funny way of writing down gradient descent. Okay, so now this new model xt plus one is then broadcast back to all the workers and the process is repeated. So this is distributed gradient descent. Everything seems to be nice. However, one of the many difficulties with this method uh, in this environment is uh, out of six arrows, the communication could be could be the bottleneck in a distributed environment, and typically it is, and these arrows are what's problematic. So we would like to do something about this. The local computation could be relatively cheap compared to the communication, and people were thinking of ways how to reduce this communication overhead somehow. And one of the most popular approaches, which is uh, so popular that in fact, it's almost synonymous with the word federated. So, uh, so to my surprise, whenever you see a paper which says federated something, it almost always means that local steps are being taken, local training is being done. So federated is almost synonymous with this uh, for some, let's say, unexplained uh, reason. So this just really points and kind of underscores uh, the, the importance of local training in uh, fair learning, which I'm going to describe next. So what is the locality? What is local training? So, so local training is this idea of modifying gradient descent or whatever method we're going to be using. I'm just using example of gradient descent here slightly in order to make the method much more communication efficient. So how does it work? We start exactly the same way as before. I'm just using a little bit smaller font here. Uh, than before because I want to squeeze in a little bit more uh, detail here. So we start with xt, and then we take one gradient step just as before. However, then we repeat the process and take another gradient step using the local data only, and another one, another one, and we take a certain number of local gradient steps. So if you look, let's say here in the middle, you would see that worker two 
just took capital K gradient steps, started from XC, pretending that uh, worker two only wants to minimize function F2. That's it. So if K is really, really huge here, like the, the number of local steps, then in fact, under some standard regularity conditions about F2, uh, worker two would minimize function F2 and worker one would minimize function F1 and worker three would minimize function F3. And uh, if that actually happened, if K was so large that uh, these three different processes would just lead to the argument of the FIs, then in the next iteration, we would just get average of the arguments that would become XT plus one and the process would repeat and it would actually lead nowhere because this kind of a method could only possibly ever find the average of the, of the minimizers of those functions. However, average of minimizers of these three functions is not the same thing as the minimizer of the average. So the method would not actually find the solution to the problem in the upper right uh, corner on the slide. So that's why K should not really be very large, but why should K have any other value than one to begin with? Well, the reason is imagine that communication takes a day, just as an example. And let's say that computation, one gradient step takes uh, one minute. Well, then it feels uh, like you have a very strange algorithm which take which does one minute of local computation and then, then waits a day uh, to communicate that update. So this seems to be very imbalanced type of a distributed system. So it's a very simple idea to get uh, to simply say, let's do more of these steps. Let's try to balance the computation and communication. And since we can't really find a way to reduce the communication, we'll just do more computation and hoping that the computation will somehow be useful. So that's really the idea of local training. Okay, so this is local gradient descent or distributed local gradient descent, the simplest possible local training uh, method. So let me pause here in case anybody has any questions. I'll really go slowly through all of this. This is why I said kind of threatened you with two hour talk at the beginning. Uh, so feel free to just ask anything. I really want to have interaction. I don't have to go through all of these things that I really could possibly say here. I would rather have, have a back, back and forth with you. So is this all clear to everybody or does anybody have any questions? It seems to be all clear since there is no question in the chat and I don't see any raised hands. And okay, there's a question by Arto. So please go ahead. Mm, hi, Peter. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, like in practice, how long does the communication take? You said it's, let's say, for a day, but in practice, how long does it take? Well, it it really depends on on the model one is trying to uh, one is trying to train. So I I've heard of cases where this could be just you know a few hours, let's say, because you could be trying to build a very simple even SVM, SVM or logistic regression model, and this is actually even used in practice in some companies. And then uh, and the, these models don't have to be even so huge, uh, but sometimes this could really be uh, 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 a lot. On the other hand, in practice, people don't use exactly this method because they would do on top of this compression and some other tricks. So, uh, so it's, it's not very easy to say how much it would have taken if people were uh, communicating the, the full models, but, but it's quite a bit. I, I cannot tell you from the top of my head uh, the calculation what it would be if an uncompressed uh, model was, uh, was uh, uh, communicated. But the, the difference between computation and communication is really huge. So I can I can take this uh, somewhere. Thanks. All right. Okay, good. So so history of local training. Uh, so we've had we've uh, outlined the the history in this paper with uh, Grigori and Kai, uh, variance reduced proskip. Uh, so this is a NeurIPS 22 paper where we have some actual contributions to the field, which I will not in fact even talk about in this talk. I made I might very briefly in one table summarize some of them. However, uh, prior to the actual scientific contributions which we have in the paper, we also have a, an extended review 
of uh, the field of local training, and we came up with this classification of local training methods into five generations. So this, uh, this is the table taken from that uh, uh, paper. And we've identified these uh, five generations, heuristic, homogeneous, sublinear, linear, and accelerated. Now this uh, identification really uh, is not, it shouldn't be seen as a complete characterization of everything that's going on, because clearly we're just kind of projecting all of, all of the history of the field into some kind of one dimensional line and five categories. Uh, however, it's still very useful uh, as it turns out, and I'll explain uh, why. So the first generation is really the generation where people came up with the idea of local training to begin with. And uh, you could trace it back to at least 2014. If you so squeeze an eye, you could go in back to like 95 to some work of, uh, of the Mangasarian, but I'll uh, go at least these eight, 10 years ago to the work of these people on the, on, on, on the slide. And all of these papers uh, suggested one idea, which is let's do more local training steps and not just one before we synchronize the parameters. So all of these. However, the last one is the most famous, uh, which, which is one of the four papers that started uh, federated learning. Um, and uh, this is the paper by Brandon McMahon and Cotters uh, from Google who came up with the federated averaging algorithm. And local training is one of the three uh, elements of federated averaging, the other two being client sampling and data sampling. And if you combine local training, client sampling, and data sampling, you get federated averaging algorithm. However, the uh, local training idea already appeared before in these other uh, papers. So this is a heuristic generation, which means there was no theory whatsoever. Uh, it, the, the, everything was really motivated by the fact that this works much better in practice, so let's do it, which is, of course, uh, great. Now, why does uh, local training work? So for those of you who have not seen this before, even though this would be a minority, uh, keep this kind of a picture in mind. So here we solve a strongly convex, smooth optimization problem. So it's one of the simplest possible things you could be solving in a distributed environment with a certain number of local steps. So if you take one local step, as I mentioned before, this is just distributed gradient descent, and you would expect to have linear convergence, and you do, because this is a semi-logarithmic plot. Uh, you have fx minus the uh, minimum of f, and you can see that the blue line, the one without the markers, it's uh, beautifully uh, kind of contouring uh, linear uh, line here in this semi-logarithmic plot, which means you get linear convergence. Okay, so all fine and nice. However, as you increase the number of local steps, two things happen. Uh, first of all, all of these methods, which have which use more local steps, they just they just become much faster initially. They need few uh, communication runs to decrease the function value initially. However, all of them also get stuck at some point. And the more local steps you take, the sooner the method gets stuck and the method would just not be able uh, to achieve high accuracy. So with 32 local steps, you get stuck at accuracy in this case, 10 to the power mi minus three, which could in fact be perfectly acceptable depending on the application. Okay, so let's say that maybe in this application, whatever it is, this is not acceptable. And let's say 10 to the power minus four is acceptable. In that case, the red line with eight local steps would be the optimal one out of all of these. So clearly uh, you don't want to not use local steps uh, if you have uh, low accuracy requirements. Uh, local steps really help massively. And in fact, in practice, the improvement could be by a factor of uh, 10 or even 100. So the effect is so huge that uh, local steps just became uh, standard and almost synonymous uh, with the word uh, federate. And now at this point, uh, there are many open questions in the field. And one is, okay, does local gradient descent actually work even in theory, or are we just lucky and we're seeing these kinds of pictures and uh, maybe somebody comes up with some function or some data set at some point, this thing just breaks down. Okay, so that's one question people ask. Another question people ask, okay, if in fact we can show that uh, the method somehow works, why does it work faster initially? Why does it get stuck? Can we get it unstuck? And so on and so forth. So there's many questions uh, people asked after they saw plots of this type. 
Okay, so the second uh, generation is in fact the first attempt at proving mathematically that local gradient descent is not a heuristic, but in fact, it's a method which solves the problem. Uh, however, in generation two, people had to assume homogeneity or limited heterogeneity of the data which generates these local functions in order to do so. So they would require uh, assumptions such as uh, strong growth conditions, so this bounded gradient diversity or bounded gradients uh, assumption. And if you look, let's say this bounded gradient diversity that you would see if C is uh, one, so there's the smallest possible constant here, then that kind of means that all the gradients are the same across these clients, which indirectly means that the functions generating the gradients are the same. Uh, so C1 is the homogeneous setup. However, if you're in the homogeneous setup, you shouldn't need fair learning at all because then you don't need communication. Everybody can just solve their local problem. All the local problems are the same. And the problem with these bounds under strong growth or bounded green diversity was that as C was increasing to infinity, and infinity means that, that the heterogeneity could be arbitrary, then the bounds just became meaningless and they would essentially say that the method doesn't work. And these are just some examples of papers uh, that I chose, so some very early works in this category. There's lots of work uh, in this area. And, however, this is very problematic because, in fact, the local gradient descent works even if the C is very huge. So uh, in this sense, uh, bounded gradient diversity or homogeneity assumptions are not uh, satisfactory. They don't explain uh, the whole thing. So something we're clearly missing. Uh, the method works even if you are in the uh, fully heterogeneous case, uh, but in theory, only if you're in the homogeneous case. So one thing to say about this homogeneous case is that uh, uh, it's very intuitively clear that uh, local training should help if you have a lot of homogeneity. Why? Because the extreme case of uh, homogeneity is that all the functions are exactly the same. And if all the functions FIs are exactly the same, then you should take infinity of local training steps because infinity of local training steps means you you take infinity of gradient steps which minimize each function. And that's exactly the minimum of the average because all the functions are the same. So attempts in this uh, generation two at uh, addressing the convergence of local gradients and can be seen as some sort of sensitivity uh, analysis on top of this uh, purely homogeneous uh, setup. And as soon as you go away from the homogeneous, you start losing. And in the extreme case, you lose everything and the method doesn't work at all. All right, so let me pause here in case anybody has any questions about the first two generations. And as I said, I really hope this to be uh, interactive. So feel free to ask anything. As I always say, because I heard other people say that there are no stupid questions, only those that you don't ask. And if you don't mind, I'll just wait to get some, uh, at least a question or two. Can people unmute themselves or not yet, uh, Sam? No, it's always everybody's uh, muted by default. But I already, OK, I'll, I'll just repeat. If you have any questions, please do either raise your hand or just post your question to the chat. And in that case, I'll try to unmute you so we can have a bit of interaction with Peter. And then you can ask your question. I always try to prove that I'm serious uh, about questions by waiting until everybody feels very uneasy. Uh, so if you feel uneasy, then I'm doing my job right. Ah, there's a question. I'd like you, uh, Shell, if you could just ask it in person so that I can hear some other voice than just mine and Simon's. Simon's voice is beautiful. Mine, not so much, but your your voices are surely 
really amazing. So I'd like to hear them. <clears throat> Hi, Peter. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'd like yes. to ask uh, how to justify that the bounded That's gradients good. are uh, reasonable because uh, it seems that the fi should be a stochastic function, right? Well, in this case, it's not. Yes, and maybe we can mute yeah. for now because we hear some background. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thanks uh, for the question. Uh, the way you should you should think of this is that people justify that not because they would say it's it's a justifiable or reasonable assumption. It was because we didn't know the community didn't know whether local training is, is a heuristic or whether under any assumptions, even maybe unreasonable ones, the method can converge. So th this, is, this is the way we should think of it. So nobody was really trying to say, oh, but in practice, all of this is true. Uh, uh, for instance, strong convexity and bounded gradients, they're not really friendly assumptions uh, together. So that's already problematic. Bounded gradients assumption is completely reasonable in non-smooth convex optimization, but in smooth one, uh, maybe not so, not so much. I, I don't want to justify it, or I, I want to actually criticize all of these assumptions because uh, assumptions should be criticized if in fact they're not necessary. And it turns out they're not necessary. So any assumption should be criticizable if it's not necessary. And in this case, it turned out uh, they were not necessary, however, at that state of understanding of the field, we didn't know. So this is the best we could do. So at that point, this was the state of the art. So this is what I would have to say about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. So can we unmute Ajit? Hi, Peter. <clears throat> hey. Yeah, uh, so I was wondering when we talk about local uh, training, uh, how we will fit into this uh, five, fifth generation or five generation of your classification when we do training on unlevel data set, like there are many work now trying to convert uh, unlevel data set to uh, supervise modeling, but they do lots of, you know, like Fed match I have mentioned or Fed UL they are doing on unlevel data sets. Well, well, originally, Fair learning was posed as a supervised learning problem, not unsupervised. Yeah. So we would work with labels. And if you don't, then use any of the many different techniques uh, to convert uh, uh, unsupervised training into supervised by just generating the labels somehow. I mean, we all know that unsupervised learning is going uh, extinct a little bit because even if you don't have labels, you're going to produce them somehow. And then yeah. you pretend you're doing supervised learning anyway. So maybe the best way to think of all of this is that I'm not going to talk about anything I'm supervising. I'm going to assume the labels are there, or if not, they're somehow automatically produced. No, actually, um, I want to just rephrase, like in FedUL, what they are trying to use surrogate level, as you said, converting unsupervised uh, training to supervised. But the right. question was like uh, a convergence, how, how and when uh, this training will converge or not because surrogate more levels are not uh, too accurate and then maybe it will take lots of time or convergence bound there. Right. Like. So, so, so these are good questions, but I, I'm fully focusing here on the supervised setup in this, uh, in this, in these five, gen five generations. I'm not talking about supervised learning. So from that point of view, all of, uh, all of this is, is kind of heuristical approach to solving the unsupervised problem. I'm not talking about unsupervised uh, in this talk. Yeah. So it's okay. a good question, uh, but I, I won't. I just yeah. won't be able yeah. to address it uh, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you're doing very well. You're already interacting, and I'm getting a third question. Awesome. So Sunny, feel free to just ask it in your own voice. Hi, Professor. Hello. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate on the key advancements uh, or what kind of techniques introduced during the homogeneous generation of local training methods and uh, something like how their contribution is towards the evolution of federated learning? Right. So, so, so the way I, I want you to think of it in, in very simple granularity, and that is that prior to generation two, uh, it was all a heuristic and there was not a single proof that this method uh, converges or finds a solution of the problem at all. 
it was just a hack, right? Which means let's just take local steps and see what happens. Oh, and it seems to work. That's it, right? So, so all of this generation two, they uh, they come up with assumptions of some time. I gave you just two of these. There, there are many more. Uh, and the way you should think of them is that uh, in an extreme case, it would say that all of these uh, functions are the same in some sense, right? So for instance, here, if B is really close to zero, then what gradients have zero, uh, what, what, sorry, what functions have zero gradients, right? So, uh, so constant functions, right? They're, they're all constant, which kind of means they're all the same. Whereas here, if C is one, uh, that kind of means uh, and kind of, by kind of, I mean, I'm waving my hands a little bit. I don't want to go into the uh, tiny details that all the functions are the same. So they have these, uh, these assumptions are different. Uh, they have various strengths and weaknesses and some of them are weaker than others, probably. And that would constitute an advancement on the previous uh, set of uh, homogeneity assumptions. Uh, I'm not going to be that detailed and look and zoom in on generation two and go through all that happened there. All that I want to say is that all of these papers in generation two, by definition of generation two, assume you're not too far from these functions being the same. And I want to criticize that and say that's problematic because in practice, they're not the same and they're actually far from being the same. And that's, that's a problem because then you're analyzing an algorithm under assumptions that don't hold in practice. And that's, that's uh, the problem of generation two. So this is all I want to say about generation two at this moment. I could elaborate later on, but maybe not now because I would also like to get to the generation five. So, and I'm sure you'll have many more questions uh, there. Okay, good. So I got my questions. Now move on to generation three. So generation three uh, asked the question, uh, can we do analysis of local training for arbitrarily heterogeneous data? So, so do we really need uh, the homogeneity assumptions or can we just dispense uh, of them completely? Uh, and uh, the answer is, uh, uh, positive, so we can actually get rid of all the homogeneity assumptions. We don't need them at all. So it turns out they were not needed. They were superfluous. And we have contributed to this with uh, former intern Ahmed uh, Khaled and uh, former PhD student who was, they were both you know, current interns and current PhD students at that time, but now former intern, former PhD student, Konstantin Mishenko. And we wrote this sequence of papers. Uh, and you can see the first of these is called first analysis of local GD and heterogeneous data, because at that time, uh, it was the first analysis of local GD on heterogeneous data. And this was just uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, so at that time, we we're able to say that uh, the method is not a heuristic. However, and this is big however, uh, uh, we could not explain uh, why the picture looks like uh, this. So we could not uh, explain why, in fact, uh, we have much faster convergence initially. And, uh, and uh, we could not also get rid of the fact that the method just stops working after uh, some time. So either, either we, can, we could remove maybe that it stops working, but then uh, the, the, the slowdown in the convergence will be so big that it would not be a very useful method. Uh, to, to summarize uh, the results in this sublinear uh, generation, the, the brief summary is this. Uh, we completely removed, and not just us, but uh, some other papers in this uh, generation, we completely removed any need to assume uh, homogeneity. The data could be, uh, and which means the functions could be arbitrarily heterogeneous. However, we could not prove uh, what you see on this picture, we could not prove that the method is better than gradient sand. In fact, it was worse than gradient sand. So this rate, this blue rate uh, of GD, of, log of gradient sand, uh, is linear in this semi-logarithmic plot, but all that we could get is a sublinear uh, convergence rate. Uh, if you wanted to see how this would look like on this plot, so it would look like similar to what you see here, except None of these colored lines, which are which are different colored than blue, would be below the blue line. They would all be on the right of the blue line. So all of the local methods that use multiple local steps would be worse than GD, even initially. And they would also just stop working after some time. So if the method worked as theoretically predicted in our paper, which of course we have 
proud of at that time because we could analyze the method without any homogeneity assumption. If the method worked in practice as in our theory, it would be a method nobody would want to use because it'd be strictly worse than gradient descent, which is not good because the method actually is much better than gradient descent. So taking local step is better empirically, uh, which means uh, we answered something in this paper, but not everything. So what we answered is you don't need homogeneity assumptions. However, you get a method which sucks, right? I mean, it doesn't work uh, well if it works as in, in theory. So that's what happened in generation three. So now, at this time of generation three, people were trying to ask uh, two questions. Well, they were trying to ask one of these questions throughout. Uh, and uh, one of these questions is why do these, why, why does this method just get stuck? Why do we have this uh, neighborhood of convergence and we cannot really get below these lines, right? Why do we have these horizontal lines here? And of course, the, the, the other important question is why is it so much steeper initially than the blue line, than gradient descent? So generation four really answers one of these questions, which is why do we get stuck? And generation five answers the other question, why we are much, much steeper initially, and in fact, always. All right, so why do we get stuck? Well, we get stuck because the method should be changed. So that's the brief answer. So you should change the method, and then you don't get stuck. And if you just stare at this uh, plot uh, a little while, every time I give this talk, people came up uh, with one solution on their own. And that was just, okay, if you use 32 local steps, try to identify the point when you get stuck and maybe then switch to 16 local steps and you switch from this uh, brown line to the uh, violet one. And then when, when you get stuck here with the violet one, uh, decrease the number of local training steps to eight, then you're going to kind of write the 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 envelope of all of these plots and you're going to have a method which works like this okay i don't you, you probably can see my uh pointer right so you would just need to start decreasing the number of local training steps and then you get a better method uh, so that such a paper exists uh however however that paper would not still belong to the fourth generation the linear generation but certainly would be an improvement of sorts so the fourth generation uh, uh, managed to remove this uh, getting stuck in a different way through uh, so-called drift reduction. So in this case, uh, arbitrarily heterogeneous data is allowed. However, uh, and we get linear rate just like GD, uh, which is great, but that's also bad that it's just like GD because it's not better than GD. And we're using the method precisely because it's much better than gradient. And the most famous method here is uh, this uh, paper by uh, Cypranid, Karim Reddy, and co-authors uh, called Scaffold from uh, three years ago or four years ago, depending on how you count. And there's some other papers. So Edward Gorbunov, Philip Hanzali, my former two PhD students and myself, we've written also a paper on this topic. And there's another nice paper, Fred Lin, on this topic and, and a few more. Uh, so these uh, uh, works, what they do, they change the local gradient descent method a little bit. And by changing it a little bit, you can see that uh, you don't get this generation 3B behavior, which is you go down linearly, then you get stuck, but it, it just keeps going down linearly. It never gets stuck. These methods don't get stuck. So that is, that is uh, really the definition of the generation. Uh, however, as I said, the problem is that uh, the methods are not faster than gradient sense. So we still don't know. We still didn't really tap into into understanding of what these uh, local steps are, local training steps are really doing. Why are we doing them if doing them does nothing to the algorithm, right? Because that's what this generation four really says. It says you take, let's say 10,000 local training steps, but you get a method which is as fast in theory as if you just took one local training step. So why are you doing them? Don't do them, right? So if the method, in other words, if the method worked in practice as it works in theory, in this generation four theory, then nobody would use those methods. Um, I can give some brief insight into why this behavior uh, is there. And the reason is if you look at all of these methods belonging to this generation, what they do is that whenever you take, let's say 10,000 local training steps, you decrease the step size by a factor of 10,000. So you take 10,000 steps with 10,000 times smaller step size, and this kind of intuitively feels like doing like you're doing the same kind of progress as one 
step with the proper step size, which is one local gradient step. And for this reason, uh, the theory could not predict any better behavior. And this is not that these people were stupid and didn't know that they should take large step size. It just the theory just didn't allow larger step size. So they knew that they should be taking larger step size. And in practice, these methods are best when they take larger step sizes. But theory didn't allow that. So that means uh, that means we're still missing uh, something at that point. Okay, and now I want to create another break and allow some more questions before I move on to the fifth generation of local training methods. So again, I drink my water and wait for a question or two. As I told you, I'm very good at awkward silences. So you would have to ask questions if you want me to move on. Ajit, so please ask away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, interactive again. So after listening this fourth generation, what I'm getting idea that if we want to study all this method, like from a uh, third to fourth, if we see we are moving from nonlinear to linear, can we have a like experimental I'm talking about? Can we do experimental re uh, experiment on just SGD and then changing this uh, that you are explaining in linear, uh, linear generation for linear, where we just uh, take the or 10,000 10, and then reduce the learning rate by 10,000. So can we have all this result uh, with just SGD and some data sets so we can see the clear picture that you are explaining just. So do you want me to like show you different plots for how SG? Uh, yeah, 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 SGD, yeah. different plot of like different generation that you explain how SGD perform on a single data set or yeah, something. Well, that well, will well, give well, well, one, one thing that I want to say here is that this is uh, all of this is true, even when you do uh, full batch methods, because I'm talking about gradient set, I'm not talking about SGD, if you notice, right? So yeah. all every client in each iteration computes the full batch gradient. So I'm not talking about SGD. However, all of these generations, they also have SGD versions of these methods. So when you look at, let's say, local GD in this paper, in this paper before, in this one, in the local, we actually also have local SGD method, or in this paper, we also have a local SGD method, as you can see right here. But I don't want to complicate, I didn't want to complicate the uh, discussion by introducing stochasticity in the gradient computation as well, because that would be taking focus away from what I really want to talk about, which is the local training. Once you have the local training, you can start doing maybe adaptive learning rate schedules. You can do sto stochastic gradients, or you can do client subsampling. You can do all kinds of other tricks, and they will just uh, uh, muddy the waters, and uh, it'd be more difficult to talk about it. But but all of these phenomena exist also for SGD. You just uh, get uh, more complicated looking, uh, you know, graphs. Yeah. Plots. Okay. Plots. Yeah. Plot. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Good. So I'll take it as a question. I'll move on to generation five. Okay. So in generation five, uh, for the first time, we uh, answer the question uh, whether local training actually is useful, uh, which means does it give a boost to grain ascent? Does it improve grain ascent? Does it decrease the number of communication rounds or not? So we're not happy with just generation four, which says you can match the rate of grain ascent. We can get the better rate than grain ascent. And what really happens, the very high level picture is this. If you do have a problem, which is L smooth and mu strongly convex, 
I didn't define L smoothness and strong convexity here, but I might do that later if we get there to that slide. So L over mu would then be the condition number of the problem, which says something about the difficulty of minimizing that function F. Then uh, for generation of methods or even gradient ascent, they would solve the problem in L over mu times log one or epsilon steps where epsilon is the accuracy target uh, you have. So log one or epsilon means you have linear convergence. And these fifth generation methods actually can solve the problem in square root of L over mu times log one over epsilon steps. So this is why uh, local training is useful because if without local training, you can solve the problem in let's say uh, uh, 10,000 uh, training rounds. With local training, you can solve it in 100 training rounds, right? And that is much, much less. So square root of 10,000 is 100 and this is much, much better. Uh, and only in generation four, we're able to explain that that's actually what happened. So this is what uh, defines uh, generation five. All right, and the first paper uh, that launched generation five with this paper that we wrote with uh, Konstantin Mishenka, Grigory Malinowski, and Sebastian Stick. And uh, we call it the Proxkip paper because the algorithm is called Proxkip. And we have three acceleration marks in the title, which is the maximum that I've ever seen, and not just among my papers, but any paper. So I apologize for that. However, at the same time, I have this disclaimer that we did apologize even in the paper, and we also have a scholarly title for the paper for those of you who don't like these uh, funny looking and embarrassing titles. Okay, so this is the first paper on that topic, and I'll talk about this briefly later on. However, once we wrote that paper, we got really excited. I can see there's a question in the chat, let me see. Okay, Alexander, please ask away. Can we unmute? Yeah, hi, Peter, Alexander here. How are you? So my question is, I described it in the chat, but maybe another interpretation assumes that I design a robot and the robot need to take decision where to go. And it's re uh, rely on some different data, vision, what is uh, sensors and is it uh, uh, settings which you describe or it's something different? You see device one is responsible for sensor one, device two for sensor two, device three for sensor three. Well, it's fine. So you can have uh, these devices could be sensors. That's that's okay. And each sensor is collecting some data. That's okay. And uh, the question is, can you formulate the uh, loss uh, on each device from the sensor data? Yes. And yes. can you can you ask uh, the question? I want to build a model which minimizes the loss across the sensors. If you can ask that question, then you are in this setup. Mm -hmm. So you would need to tell me whether that's the kind of, whether that question would make sense. And if it does make sense, then you would be in this setup, yes. Okay, good. I'm, uh, 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 is it your answer or are you asking me, sorry? No, that's that's my answer. I mean, okay. you, could, you mm -hmm. could answer my question, but I'm saying if you can answer that question to yourself, then you could answer from me. Mm -hmm. Because okay. I can ask it for you. I don't know that much about your setup. Uh, Thank you. And we can also just chat about this also offline or at the end or at, at any point. Thank you. Okay, okay good. Uh, so, th so then we're excited about this uh, because finally, after many years of uh, really thinking about why local training uh, helps, and this question existed from the beginning of early learning. So federal learning, as I said, is almost synonymous with, uh, with local training. However, until last year, we didn't know that local training actually even helped in theory. There was no theory that could explain it. Obviously, we knew it empirically, but the empirical knowledge is something else than theoretical knowledge, and these are intertwined entities, and one helps the other, right? So we wanted to have a theoretical answer as well. So then uh, we were excited, and then we wrote another paper with Abdurrahman Sadiev and Dmitry Kovalov, uh, a current student and former PhD student, and then we wrote another one with with uh, Kai and, and Grisha. So this was the one which, uh, which, uh, uh, in which we define these five generations to begin with. Uh, then another one with Lohan, who is here in the audience, uh, as far as I understand. Let me click on the, yes, I can see his name there. Hello, Lohan. So, uh, so we wrote this paper about, uh, about uh, RAND prox, which is another point of view at Proxcube. In fact, generalization of Proxcube in a certain way. I even have a, a couple of slides on that, but I'm pretty sure I will not get that far. 
uh, and then and then further papers, further papers. So I want to mention at least, uh, let's say this one with uh, Arto Maranian and Meher Safarian because I know the Arto agreed, asked question initially. So he's this co-author, he's here as well. And I don't know whether other co-authors are in the audience. I didn't really look through the list of participants. But, but uh, the point is that now that uh, we were able to break this barrier, uh, we could ask other questions. And I'd like to tell you something about what kind of questions we ask. And I have this huge table here. And I want to spend some time, maybe even 10 minutes talking about this. And if I'm looking at my watch, 10 minutes is you know, a lot of time, but I, I warn you, I'm going to talk about for, for two hours. I mean, feel free to leave uh, at some point, uh, uh, but those of you who stay, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, unless uh, there's still at least one person staying, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep talking. Okay, so, so let me go through this. Uh, in the Prosky paper, which I still didn't explain what it was, we used uh, gradient descent as the local optimizer. So the, the local training steps were actually performed by gradient descent. However, in some other papers, uh, we, could, we could use SGD as the local uh, solver. In fact, even in Prosky, we, use, we also used SGD. I just didn't mention it here. Uh, and in some papers, in fact, in two papers, we can use absolutely any local optimizer. Uh, for, for, for the local training and the theory still works. Of course, you can always use any optimizer, but then maybe theory breaks. But in this case of APDA and of uh, 5GCS, the theory still works with any optimizer. So this points in the direction that in fact, the local optimizer might in fact be a plug and play thing and you can just use any. Okay, so then still looking at this first line, uh, the reason why Prosky works, and still I didn't explain you what exactly it does, is that we could prove that in order to optimize the number of communication rounds, you need to optimize also the number of local training steps, and you should have square root of condition number of local training steps. So this is the first result in the in the in fairy learning literature, where you have a formula for how many local training steps you should take. If you look at any other paper from generation four or earlier. Uh, uh, you, K, number of local training steps was a hyperparameter. And if you look at the theory, the, the, the prediction always was that either K equals one is the best. So one local training step is the best, or it didn't matter. So any number of local steps is, is the same uh, as one local step, which means you don't get any benefit from local steps. But this is because the analysis was not as strong as our analysis in this generation five. And here we could predict that the number of local training steps, optimal number of local training steps is square root of condition number. If you do less, you get worse performance. If you do more, you get uh, worse performance. You still take a condition number training steps in total. So L over mu log training steps. However, only every square root of condition number of training steps you communicate. So you have square root of condition number communication rounds, square root of condition number local training steps, and you multiply them out, you get condition number of uh, gradient steps. So this is actually how this acceleration works. Now, uh, two huge issues. In ProSkip, we couldn't use client sampling at all. So all the clients had to participate at all times, and all of us know who do federated learning that in practical federated learning, Let's say you train something on some millions of devices in each communication round, maybe only 10,000 or 5,000 can communicate and not all 10 million. So this raises the question, is this fifth generation of local training methods combinable with client sampling? In the Proskip paper, we didn't have an answer. There's orthogonal approach to a communication acceleration, which is communication compression. There's a lot of works on using top K, random K or or um, you know, quantization, compression, and so on. This is very different approach to, to communication acceleration than local training steps. And the question is, is this approach combinable with communication compression or not? Because at this point, these were two different strands of the literature. Uh, and uh, at that moment, these were not really uh, com combinable. And another question, does this support decentralized setup? By which I mean, can we, uh, go away from the start topology where each client speaks to one hub and then the hub speaks to everybody. And can we solve a problem on an arbitrary connected network 
where there is no orchestrating server, but where there's, there's peer to peer communication along the edges of a graph. And in fact, even in the Prosky paper, we had a positive answer to this. All right, so I can see a question in the chat. Okay, so there's another question. And Ajit is asking, no, Ajit is answering a question to Alexander, I, I think. So that doesn't seem to be a question for me. And Thomas is asking something. So Thomas, there please. A new question, yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. I was hey. wondering, in, in this table, you have uh, this number of communication rounds uh, order, and they all seem to achieve the same order. Is this uh, reflective of what, what is seen in practice, or do you think the theory can go further? So I so think this is optimal. Just like an inestor of acceleration, for strongly convex L smooth problems, you have square root of condition number being the optimal number of iterations. So we believe we believe this is not improvable, but that doesn't mean that you cannot improve some other things. So for instance, right. what we know is improvable is the number of local training steps. Uh, so if you look, let's say at this row of APDA inexact, it says better right here where I'm circling. Mm -hmm. This is better. We could actually show that uh, you... Uh, may work with different power than than the uh, one half power of the condition number for the number of local training steps mm -hmm. with a different method. But you need to have a different local training method. So, for instance, you can use accelerated gradient descent instead of gradient descent for the local optimizer. And there's even a better method than accelerated gradient descent that you can use in this case, and you get even uh, fewer local training steps mm -hmm. here. So there, there, there is there is a chance to improve something here. Another chance uh, to improve something is to use client sampling and make it more practical, allow for sampling. But then as soon as you introduce sampling, as we do, let's say, in these two papers, 5GCS five, five and Tamuna, then this you will pay a cost for this, and this will increase the number of communication runs. That's why these two rows say worse. So mm -hmm. by worse, uh, I only mean if you do client sampling is worse, if you don't, it's the same. All right. So it will be still square root of something, but of a some somewhat larger condition number, which accounts for the uh, uh, client uh, sampling procedure. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, okay. And with communication compression, the story is interesting. You can get uh, a better method. So, for instance, this compressed Kafnu turns out to be the first method in the literature which combines local training and it provably accelerates based on local training and at the same time uses communication compression and provably improves because of communication compression. So I can really see that these two approaches are orthogonal because we get combined benefits and the total communication complexity becomes uh, even better. So this is that this column, total communication complexity becomes even better because of this. Uh, okay, I can see some other questions in the chat, so let's see. So let's unmute these other people who are asking. Thank you for asking the question. Yeah. <clears throat> Shingu, please go ahead. You should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Professor. Yeah, I just want the, the intuition behind the accelerate learning uh, process and um, because if we want to uh get better performance we need to uh put more uh, resource to compute so i just wonder the uh intuition behind the accelerated work thanks okay so so here the acceleration so let's look at proskip i think your question even applies to proskip so you ask, why do we have accelerated communication number of communication runs, which means square root of condition number rather than condition number? Uh, and you said that maybe we would need more compute because of it. And the answer is no, we don't need more compute. We still take a local gradient steps. So that's not really uh, more compute. We allow local training. And the best way maybe to think about local training methods, the, the best first picture you should have in your mind is this. Assume that uh, computation is so cheap on each device that it doesn't matter at all. And all that you want to count is the number of communication runs. Okay, so if, if, if you believe that, okay, if you are really in that setup, and you might not be in that setup, but just, just 
you know, bear with me for a second. So if you are in the setup that local training is completely cheap, then it doesn't matter how many local training steps you take. It will, it will be zero time, right? And uh, only the number of communication rounds matters. Now, I know that you mentioned computation complexity, and it's important. And we think it's important too. And that's why uh, in some of these papers, we actually ask exactly the question that you asked, which is, all right, now that you have access to communication complexity, do you really need to bother all of these clients with square root of condition number of uh, local training? Can we bother them less? Can we, you know, not, not do it th this way? And uh, for instance, in this paper, ABD, and exactly as I said, by using different local optimizer, you, you can do better. And in the, uh, uh, let's say the VR Proxkip uh, paper, uh, we can uh, use SGD, variance reduce SGD as the local optimizer. You get more local training steps. However, each local training step is not using the full batch, but some mini batch. And the, the total uh, number of uh, passes over the local data is actually going to be, uh, is actually going to be uh, better for this method if you, if you, if you do this uh, correctly. And if you now account for combined communication time plus computation time, you get a better theoretical result. And in fact, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, in fact, these two are the first two papers where this effect is actually proved that uh, for the first time in the literature of learning, we can think of theoretical questions which combine communication complexity and computation complexity. Before this in generation four or earlier, people had to ignore computation complexity in theory and the reason was because even if you ignore computation complexity in theory, the communication complexity was worse or the same as that of grain and sand. So that there would not be any benefit uh, whatsoever. But now that we can see the benefit of local training, we can finally ask, can we maybe do less local training and still get uh, this uh, communication acceleration? So, and, and uh, let's say in these two, the papers you get an answer like that and in some some of the others uh, too okay so what else do i want to say about this table i don't want to really cover this fully but maybe i want there's to... one more I... question peter there's one more question in the oh. chat oh, okay so there's another question yeah. all right so let's unmute uh, vilma right yeah please go ahead vilma Okay, it might not work. So then I'll just read out loud question for you. Uh, so Wilma asking what kind of client sampling methods uh, did you use with these methods? Right, so, so here we have very simplistic client sampling methods. Uh, so we choose just a subset of the clients uniformly at random. So the simplest possible client sampling you can have. We're not saying this is the practical way of doing this. But at least some sort of client sampling is compatible with uh, accelerated local training. And we're happy that uh, we could get this because we really couldn't get it for a very long time. You can see the six papers. They were, we're not able to uh, throw in client sampling into the mix. It uh, turned out to not be uh, trivial. But then we found a way in the 5GCS paper. And then also we found a way in the in Tamuna paper. And uh, so now we know that uh, these things are combinable. And this also points to uh, future research that, uh, that you can do. So you could, you could look at these works and try to uh, come up with more realistic or more complicated client sampling mechanism and, and see whether one can still run the algorithms, whether they would work, whether theory would work and so on and so forth. So this is opportunity for the research. So Mohammed is asking a question. Let's unmute him. Hello. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, I'm just working on an application that we cannot uh, allow all clients to join the training process, uh, which is asynchronous FL. But I'm just uh, want to know which approach will work better 
uh, with less communication around and also allow a client sampling. So just a few number of clients join the training process. Right. Okay. So, well, I have this column on client sampling right here. And you could see that the first six papers, they don't allow client sampling at all. Uh, we didn't know how to make that work, but here in these other two, 5GCS Tamana, we could do it. Uh, so they would work also with client sampling, but then I was reading what you asked, and you also mentioned asynchronous steps. None of these uh, methods is an asynchronous method. All of these methods work in the following way. Uh, everybody, all the clients do some local training. And when all of them do local training, uh, when they finish, they send the message to the orchestrating server. And then the orchestrator server waits for everybody, even for the slowest one. And then the models, model gets updated, gets broadcast to everybody, and the process is repeated. So none of these methods are asynchronous methods, uh, which is, again, a big question here, open question. Can we make any of these methods asynchronous and gain from it? So this, at the moment, is uh, not clear. So this uh, should be addressed uh, by someone. I have some thoughts on this, but uh, none of these methods are asynchronous. Uh, why I'm asking you this question because I'm working on application with satellite and the visibility or, uh, to communicate with the server is it challenging. So we are trying to uh, just allow, even I have one or two satellites who will join the FL training process, we can um, achieve faster conversion. Uh, if well, I will wait all satellites to join the communication round, it will take several days due to the push, the speed of satellites and also the rotation of them. Yeah, so if you if you only allow fewer clients to participate, you will not have the faster convergence. You can only get slower convergence. However, obviously, if you, you might have an application, just the one that you mentioned, where it's not possible to wait for everybody, and then you just must update in the way that you described. So I think it'd be very nice if we could have a follow-up discussion just one-on-one -on -one later on and we can talk about this at more length. And then maybe I can suggest which of these things could possibly work, but then I would need to learn a little bit more about uh, your exact setup. But thanks for asking the question. Okay, so I think this is roughly all I wanted to say. Maybe I will highlight one more thing here, which is this Gradsky paper, uh, since, Arto is still in the audience, is he? Let me just check. Yes, he's still in the audience. And he's Carter. He's the first author of the paper, Gradskip. So here in this Gradskip paper, we ask a very interesting question, which is this. Uh, and that's a very unique. Uh, it, this Gradskip paper is very unique among all of these other papers in this way. So we ask the following question. What if some clients have not important data and others have very important data? None of these other papers ask that question, but here we do ask that question. Uh, so imagine that uh, some client has such unimportant data that any updates that that client is going to make will not affect really the strength of the model. In such case, you can imagine that why should we bother that client and ask the client to take square root of condition number local training steps? Maybe they don't have to take any local training steps or very few local training steps. And maybe those clients that have very important data they should take a lot of local training steps. And in fact, uh, this intuition can be captured theoretically. And it's really true that one can improve the proskip method in such a way that you allow the clients who have more important data to take more local training steps and those that have less important data to take less local training steps, and you will benefit from it. And by that, I mean that the communication complexity will still be the same, however, you can probably show that uh, that uh, that uh, the no the total number of local training steps um, across uh, all of these clients actually is going to be smaller than if you are following this pro proscript prescription, which says everybody has to do this. And the effect can be really huge. In fact, I could even I even have one slide on this Gradskip uh, paper. Let me see what I'm going to. And maybe I'll quickly just jump to it. I'll show you that one slide so you can see how many other slides I have, which I'm not going to cover unless you're a die, diehard fan and you stay with me. Okay, so here's the grass skip uh, slide. Uh, 
So here on the slide on the left, you can see, we have 20 clients here, by the way, 20 clients. And 19 of these clients, they have L smoothness constant, which is between 0 0.1 and 1. And by L smoothness constant, we mean just the Lipschitz, uh, con Lipschitz uh, constant of the gradient of the local uh, function, which is defined by the local data. However, there's one client that is an outlier, and the smoothness constant for that is 10,000. So it's much, much bigger than all the others. So this means, we say, this means that this client has much more important data. So we allow this client to take many more local training steps than these other clients. Now, if you compare uh, this at the orchestrating server level, if you compare this to proskip, you will see that the method decreases the function value equally fast as proskip. So if you don't look at what local training is happening, if you only look at every communication around, you see that these are indistinguishable methods, right? However, if you look inside what happens on the clients, you can see that proskip bothers the clients 15 times more than Gradskip. So Gradskip simply allows these 19 clients to take many fewer local training steps than this one. And because of it, this red line is 15 times, uh, means 15 times uh, less work than this uh, blue line. And the reason really is that in, in, in Proxkip, everybody has to take as many local training steps as the worst outlier. But in Grasskip, we can improve on it and we can allow those that have smaller allies to take fewer local training steps. So, so this, is, this is that. And then I go all the way back to the table. And now I want to, okay, so where's the table? Right here. Okay. And, all right, so there's Mohammed just saying thank you. All right, good. So now I want to allow everybody who thought this is a standard F uh, flow talk to give you a green light to go home and uh, to your families, friends, and whatnot. Uh, so feel free to 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 leave. Uh, but uh, if anybody is still interested in me continuing, I'm quite happy to continue and make this into a longer talk. So thank those of you who managed to stay all the way until now. And I'll just observe the participant count. And if it doesn't drop to zero in the next minute or so, then I'll just keep talking a little bit more. And you can even tell me if you want me to continue or not. You can unmute yourself and just, just tell me. Sunny wants me to continue. So... Even if Sunny is the only person remaining, I'll just continue. <laughs> but as I said, I don't want anybody to be hostage to my manners here, my bad manners. So please uh, feel free to stick around or leave as you feel fit. Okay, good. So, so what I want to tell you now is uh, somehow, how does this proxy method really work? And uh, can we, can we, unpack a little bit this number of communication runs here and number of local training steps uh, into some equations into, into, into more detail. So I'm going to tell you something a little about the Proskip algorithm. So first of all, I have this slide, which I took from the paper, where you can see that when you compare Proskip to the generation four or three methods, you'll see that all of the other methods, the generation four, they had O of kappa, uh, number of communication rounds where kappa is the condition number. And this generation three, the sublinear, there was even worse because it's not even linear. So there's no O tilde. There's no logarithmic dependence on epsilon, but sublinear, just one over epsilon dependence on epsilon. Uh, however, for generation five, we get the square root of uh, kappa uh, dependence. And really, the we, we, what we really get is a more general result, which looks like this in this first bl blue row, which says, that uh, the number of communication runs Proskip needs is P times condition number plus one over P, where P is the probability of communication. So what we do in, in Proskip is that we keep taking local gradient steps in lockstep. Each client takes a gradient step, then gradient step, and at every iteration, they all flip coin, or in fact, there's just one global coin flip. Uh, and with very small probability, uh, these uh, clients are going to stop and they will communicate their updates to the server. 
And with very high probability, they will just continue taking local gradient steps. So P is that probability. And uh, our complexity result depends on that probability. So for any uh, probability, we get some rate, but then we can optimize over this probability. And you can kind of guess by looking at this that the best P is the P for which these two uh, quantities, um, I mean, you can just take derivative and set it to zero, and you will see that the best P is really one over square root of uh, condition number, just like this second row here says. So P, the optimal probability should be one over square root of condition number, which really says that you should take square root of condition number local training steps on average. And if you do so, you get this accelerated communication complexity. I can see question here. Good, so Mohammed is just cheering uh, on me. Thank you very much. Um, good, so now I'll move on a little bit further. So I will unpack this into a theorem. So don't worry if you didn't understand some parts of this because I will formalize it a little bit later. But now I want to show you a plot of how these uh, methods work when you run them. But when you run them exactly as the theory tells you, you should run them. Okay, so that's very important. Uh, so you run any of these generation four methods or even generation three. So the green one is generation three, but scaffolds, scaff, new fedlin, the blue, red, and black, they are generation four. And you can see that they hardly move the needle in terms of decreasing the function value after many communication rounds. If you run them exactly as the theory behind those papers predicts. Now you can argue whether this is a fair or unfair way of running an algorithm. But I'm saying it's fair because I'm telling you how I'm running it. And when I tell you, then it's fair. Right? I'm running exactly as the theory predicts. Now we run SCAFNU, which is the proskip method applied to varied learning. Uh, that's our method, according to theory. And you can see that there's just several orders of magnitude gap. So the gap is just humongous. This is the difference between generation five and the previous generations. Now, here is, uh, here is a very important comment. And that is these methods, in fact, many of them are very good methods, except the theory behind them is not good. How can we see that? We can see that by running these methods with fine-tuned parameters, hyperparameters, such as step size. Let's not take the step size, let's say, of scuff old or fedlin uh, as predicted by theory. Let's just do some grid search and take the best one in hindsight. If you do that, you can see that scaffold and scaffnew, which is our method, they do almost entirely the same, almost exactly the same. And Fedlin and uh, as local GD, so as local GD is our previous uh, paper, they do similarly. So there could be maybe two orders of magnitude difference, but uh, but the difference to this flat region right here is really really huge. Local GD is the worst of them all. So the difference between generation three and these other ones is humongous. So what these experiments really point to is that these generation four methods as algorithms were good, except we are using them with suboptimal parameters and not using them. The theory predicts suboptimal parameters. And if you then run them according to theoretical predictions, they will become very uh, bad algorithms. But if you fine tune these parameters, they will become good algorithms. Now, this could be a fluke. It could be they were lucky in this experiment. And maybe that's the case, but I don't believe so. I believe those methods are really good, but, uh, uh, but we don't know why. And this is another open problem in the literature. So if somebody can, let's say, look at uh, Fedlin or, or Scaffold as they are and prove that uh, these methods have actually accelerated communication uh, uh, complexity so that they belong to generation five uh, methods, then, uh, then you can write a paper about them. Okay, so now you can redo exactly the same experience with SGD, uh, making, uh, uh, you know, answering one of these uh, questions that I got. And if you, if you run it with SGD, you get very, very similar plots. So I don't even have to repeat what I said. All of this is done on super simplistic experiments because this is just proof of concept here. I, I want to just highlight in a pedagogical way what the difference is between generation five and these previous generations. Now you can ask, since you're doing a communication acceleration, why don't you do it with uh, Nestor's uh, accelerated gradient descent method? 
And one answer could be that if you run uh, Proskip and compare it to Nestor of acceleration, then Proskip uh, could be much, much better than Nestor of acceleration. So this is one way you can answer this. Okay, so now uh, I'll pause a little bit. And after this pause, I'll take a question or two. And after this pause, I'll tell you how we actually develop the Proskip algorithm from a mathematical point of view. Like uh, I'll tell you about the formulation and I'll tell you about the main uh, result. But I'll pause here. If you have any question, just feel free to unmute yourself. Right now, you should be able to do so. I think in this case, I will move on. <clears throat> uh, but nevertheless, if you do have a question, feel free to ask even about the slides that I talked about in the past. Okay, so how do we develop proskip and why do we call the method proskip in the first place? So it has something to do with skipping a prox. So let's talk about this. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, optimization formulation of early learning, which we chose in this paper, is this one, just minimizing the average of functions, and is in a number of clients. However, in order to develop the method, uh, we came up with this uh, reformulation, which is not a new reformulation. It's a classical reformulation in the liter literature on distributed optimization, which is called the consensus reformulation. So what it does is that you replace every x, all of these nx's by xi, so you get freedom to every client to train their own model, which is possibly different, right? So you have average of fi's of xi's. Everybody has complete freedom to train model that they want. If that was the change and the only change we're going to make, then you don't need fair learning at all because minimizing the average of fi's of xi's simply means everybody minimize their own function fi and you don't need any communication for that. However, we take the freedom away immediately by introducing this uh, penalty. And this is a classical zero infinity penalty, which says that uh, you pay zero penalty if all the models are the same and infinity penalty if they are not. And because of this, this mathematical formulation is completely equivalent to the previous formulation. Because if you want to minimize the sum of this average and this penalty, obviously you better make sure that the penalty is zero and not infinite, otherwise this will not be a minimum. So mathematically, these two problems are fully equivalent. Now, uh, our algorithm is really an algorithm for solving this reformulation. And in fact, we uh, abstract a little bit even further. So we replace this average by an arbitrary uh, uh, function, uh, convex, uh, strongly convex smooth function. And we replace this uh, regularizer or penalty by arbitrary proper closed convex function. This is because uh, this uh, regularizer, even though it looks uh, funny because it has value zero and infinity, it has some nice mathematical properties such as it is a proper function, closed function and convex function. Uh, I'm not going to really define these things in any amount of detail, but convexity, you can imagine what it means. In fact, it means convexity of this epigraph of the function. Closeness means closeness of the epigraph. And if epigraph is the set, if you kind of fill water, fill the graph with water, that set is called the epigraph. Okay, so what we're really going to attack is this abstraction of the problem. We want to minimize the sum of two functions. One of them is very nice, which is this f, is going to be L smooth and mu strongly convex, which means that this Bregman divergence is between these two quadratic bounds. And the other function is going to be ugly in the sense that it's non-smooth. It could have values such as your infinity. It could be non-differentiable. However, it will not be too ugly because it will be proper closed and convex. It will have these three beautiful properties. And on top of it, we assume that it is proximable, which means that you can compute the proximity operator of the function. So what is the proximity operator function? It's, a, it's an operator which maps an x into minimizer of this quadratic per perturbation of the function psi. So 
uh, the way you should think of it is that you, you really want to minimize this uh, function psi. However, you at the same time want to be very close to point X in proximity of point X. So you, so you put there this penalty, which penalizes distance of U from X and you output this uh, uh, a minimizer of this sum, which is approximate minimizer of psi, uh, but uh, approximate in the sense it cannot be too far from X. So this is the proximity operator. And we're going to assume that this proximity operator can be computed. Now, what is the proximity operator of this particular penalty, this one? It turns out that the proximity operator of this is exactly the averaging operator where you average these XIs. And averaging involves communication and communication is what we want to avoid. So that's precisely what will happen uh, when you do communication in ferret learning. And I'll unpack it here and then I'll pause again at this slide, uh, allowing uh, some questions here. So now there is a classical algorithm that uh, you can read in almost any book for solving a problem of this composite type. And the algorithm is called proximal gradient descent. And proximal gradient descent works in this way. You first pretend that this regularizer, this penalty is not there at all. And you take a gradient step with respect to the first function. So you take this gradient step. In other words, you apply a gradient operator. And then after that, you correct by taking the proximity operator of the function gamma psi, not just psi, but gamma psi, where gamma is the learning rate. And in this way, you correct for uh, the previous uh, negligence of not taking psi into account. This method probably minimizes the sum of these two functions, of the smooth function and of the non smooth regularizer. Sorry. So this is textbook knowledge. Uh, people know about this method and they know how it works and everything is nice. However, in our setting, keep in mind that this proximity operator exactly uh, refers to communication because we do proximity operator. We apply proximity operator of this function right here and proximity operator of that function means averaging of these models. And you can only average these local models by communicating with the orchestrating server. So if you look at proximal gradient descent as a method and you ask yourself the following question, how can I avoid communication, which is expensive? What you could do, you could just not do the proximity operator. You don't, you don't evaluate the proximity operator most of the time. And when you don't do it, imagine that you take, let's say, 100 steps of this proximal gradient descent method, but you just don't evaluate this orange thing. You just ignore it completely. What would it mean? In the ferreted learning setting, what it would mean that all the clients will take exactly 100 local gradient steps. And then if at the 101st iteration, you evaluate the proximity operator also, then at that point, the final channel. models get averaged. So there's a question here. So Mohammed, you were asking a question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, anyway, I wanted to pause here because this is really uh, where our main idea uh, can be seen. So our idea of doing proc skip, which me means we want to skip the prox evaluation so we want to run this proximal gradient ascent, but we want to be very lazy on the evaluation of the proximity operator because uh, evaluating the proximity operator precisely means communication. And evaluation of this gradient operator means local training. So we want to do a lot of local training and the proximity evaluation we want to do only every now and then, uh, very rarely, so as to save on uh, communication. So I'll pause here in case uh, you have any questions. And here I'll wait again for a question or two. Hi, Professor. 
I I have a, a very elementary question about the function. Uh, what is the function of the plus plus uh plus oper operator? Okay. Can you explain a little bit? So you have question about what about the proximal operator or about the the side? Yeah. Uh, about the proximal operators, uh, how how does it work? So I just want to know a little bit about it. Okay. So, okay. So a little bit about it. All right. So let me go to this previous slide. This slide. So <clears throat> imagine. For, for instance, that this function psi, this penalty, is a function which is zero on some convex set and plus infinity outside of the convex set. So let's say that the convex set is unit ball, okay? Uh, centered at the origin with unit diameter. So this function psi would be zero inside and infinity outside. Then what does it mean to, to minimize f plus that function? It's actually equivalent to minimizing function f constraint to the unit ball, because you don't want to go outside unit ball, the sum will be infinite, right? So this is a way of writing yeah. down the constraint optimization problem without constraints. So it's just a mathematical trick to turn a constraint optimization problem into unconstrained because you put the constraint into this penalty, which would be infinity outside of the constraint set, right? Now, in that case, the proximity operator of such a function, which is zero on a convex set and infinity outside of the convex set, is nothing else than just projection operator onto that convex set, so, which means finding the closest point in the convex set. So this method, proximal gradient descent, becomes projected gradient descent in that case, which means you take a gradient set, and if it goes outside of the constraint, you just project it back onto the constraint set. So if you understand this intuition that proximal gradient descent is just a generalization of, pro of projected gradient descent, then I think uh, you know, that, that, that there might be an answer to your question. It might satisfy you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. And in our case, it will be projected gradient descent because we work with uh, this particular penalty, which is exactly indicated function of this convex set, that all the x's are the same. So if you value the proximity operator of this function, it is the projection on the set. And projection on the set exactly means that you need to average all of these xi's. I didn't write down the formula for the projection onto the set, but it involves the computation of the average. And you can only compute the average by communicating. So the high level idea here is when you run this proximal gradient descent or projected gradient descent, in our federated learning setup, evaluating prox will be equivalent to communicating. Okay. okay I see. Thank Good. You. Good. Now, here is the main theorem for proximal gradient descent, which everybody knows. This is a textbook material. If the number of iterations is at least condition number, which is this ratio of the smoothness constant and strong convexity constant times log one over epsilon. Uh, where this is the error tolerance, then you have solved the problem if you choose the step size correctly. And this means that the uh, model parameters at iteration t will be at this distance from the optimal parameters x star. And you see you get an epsilon uh, solution uh, compared to the initial distance. So this is an honest theorem which says you need L over mu times log one over, log one over epsilon iterations to solve the problem. Typically, epsilon is not very tiny. So this log one or epsilon is maybe five. So this theorem really tells you, you need five times condition number iterations, which means communications uh, to converge. So now at the heart of our uh, discovery here is uh, the realization that you don't need to evaluate the prox every time to get the same result. So it's an overkill to evaluate the prox every time when you follow the gradient uh, evaluation. So that's really what the uh, prox clip really uh, says. And that's what the, the theorem that I'll describe in a few slides is going to really say. So now I can describe prox clip in uh, multiple ways, but I chose this one. I'll choose two approaches. The first approach, I'll describe a method which is far, far, far better than Proxkip. 
okay? Because it will skip all the proxy evaluation. So this is a method which never needs to communicate anything and it solves the problem. So its communication complexity is even better than that of proskit because you skip all the communications. However, the method is uh, theoretical only, you cannot implement it. So it has one catch and there's nothing you can do to overcome the catch uh, unless you think about it properly and you come up with approach two where you overcome that issue, which is what the proskit method actually does. So let me go through approach one first. So I claim that you can solve this federated uh, learning problem, the problem of minimizing, uh, okay, let's just talk about uh, minimizing F plus psi just at this level of abstraction. And I claim that you can forget about the regularizer fully, you can throw it away and instead solve this optimization problem where you just linearly perturb the smooth function in the formulation. Okay, so you are supposed to minimize F plus psi, remember, and I throw the psi away completely. And I do it because I never want to even do prox uh, evaluation. I don't want to do prox gradient ascent. I just want to do gradient ascent. But uh, in order to be able to throw this function away, I actually need to perturb by this linear function, function f. And I have to use a very particular perturbation whose gradient is exactly the gradient of f at x star, where x star is the solution to the problem I'm trying to solve. So you can already see how this is sketch 22. Because in order to produce H star, I need to know X star, but X star is something that I'm trying to find. So I can't really implement this. But imagine I had this magical H star. Somebody just gave it to me. Some deity just decides to be benevolent and says, here, Peter, you have H star, feel free to do whatever you want. And as soon as I get it, I do this linear perturbation and I say, I will solve this problem. Okay, it turns out if you solve this optimization problem, its solution will be X star. Under some assumptions, I'm going to hide those assumptions a little bit, but they are completely reasonable assumptions. And this really follows by first order optimality condition. Just set the gradient of this function to zero, which is this. And if F is well behaved, <clears throat> then the only solution of this will be X is equal to X star. So what I'm trying to say is that you can throw away completely this regularizer, if you're willing to perturb F by this magical linear perturbation, and then just solve that problem. And by doing so, you don't ever have to touch Psi, which means you never have to do prox of Psi, which means you never have to communicate anything. <laughs> okay, good. Now, what would happen if you run gradient ascent on this formulation? How would the method look like? Hmm. So it would look like, let me drink some water. It would look like this. I just take gradient of this linearly perturbed function, which is exactly this, right? If you take gradient of this function, you get gradient of F minus gradient of this linear term, which is exactly H star. So gradient of F minus, minus H star is exactly gradient of that function. So what this is, is just gradient descent applied to this problem, nothing else, okay? I hope everybody sees that. And now I just say, just run this grain and send until you're done. So good. So this would solve my problem if I had this magical H star and I would not need any access to this prox of psi. In other words, I would never need to communicate anything. Of course, I don't have the H star and that's the problem. So the way now you can think of proxkip is, is a method which looks just like this by where this H star, we don't assume it's known, but we also learn it on the way. So we come up with a secondary iteration, which updates estimates of H star, because we don't know this magical H star, we need to find it. So we'll have a sequence of H's of these shifts. This is also something that is used to do the drift reduction. We have a sequence of these H's, and we only update the H when we communicate. When we don't communicate, we keep the H estimate intact. I can see there's a question. Okay, Sam has to leave. So I'm going to self-sacrifice uh, myself uh, from now on. Take care, Sam. All right, so, um, so this is uh, the magical method, but now we need to remove the magic and start estimating the unknown quantity H star. 
And that's actually what is Proxkip. So now I'll describe Proxkip uh, fully up to three question marks. So Proxkip looks like this. Do this and hopefully uh, replace the H star by a sequence of H's which converge to H star. That's what Proxkip is. And now how do we actually do it? How do we update the HT? And that's uh, the rest of the method. So uh, we will update the H only when we access uh, the proximity operator of Psi and we do it this way. So we take the step as I described before, and then with some very high probability, one minus P, so P is very small. What we do is we don't change the shift, the H, and we remove the head from this XT plus one, which means with very high probability, this is precisely running this method, this method, but with some estimate of H instead of H star, and the estimate we call HT. Okay, so with very high probability, just keep doing this over and over and over with some estimate instead of H star. That's what this method is. However, if we never change this HT, it would never converge to H star and we could never really solve the problem. So with some very small probability, what are we going to do? We're going to evaluate the procs and through evaluation of procs, we learn something new about H and we update the H and we also update the XT plus one. And this is fully the proxy algorithm. The only thing that is missing here is uh, these three question marks. And if I once I fill in these three question marks, you can go and implement this method. So this is it. So I want to pause here and uh, open the discussion so that uh, anybody who has any doubts about anything related to this method can, can ask. And I believe you should be able to unmute yourselves. At least I hope uh, Samuel set it up in such a way. So let's test this. Maybe somebody can unmute themselves and just say something like hello, even if you don't have a question to ask. Hello, hello. Hey, okay, so you can do it, great. But this was a catch, now you have to ask a question. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. So is there anything you'd like to ask about the proxkit method? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit surprised that gamma is constant. Why you not use it every <clears throat> so, Because we will do uh, here the analysis in L smooth and strongly convex setting. And it is known that in the L smooth and strongly convex setting, methods such as gradient descent can work very well with just constant step size. Even accelerated gradient descent of Nestor works with constant step size. So it's because we work with, I would say, simple enough functions, which are smooth and strongly convex. Once you start working with functions where you, let's say, only have smoothness and convexity, but not, not strong convexity, then maybe you want to have a decreasing learning schedule. And if you, if you work in non-convex setup, maybe you want to choose the step sizes differently. But because we work in simple enough setup, then gamma doesn't have to depend on it. Thank you. Okay, so I'll really wait on here because this is the method. I have this next slide where the method is described formally, but I don't want to really go through this. I think it's best to describe the method at this at this semi-formal level where these three question marks are unexplained. And I just want to make sure everybody understands what the method is doing. So I did my best at explaining what it's doing, but I'm pretty sure you still have some questions. Okay, so I'll move once somebody asks one question. So let's let's agree on this kind of re resolution of this conundrum. Somebody has a question and this frees me up and I will be able to continue. 
Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Could you once again elaborate on HT? Like, what is the motivation, intuitive motivation behind it, putting in inside the update? So, you mean inside this update here? Uh, no, inside point one. Okay, so, so the H, the intuitive way of thinking of it, I mean, one intuitive way of thinking, there's multiple ways, but the one that I chose here for this talk is that H is supposedly, supposed to be gradient of f at x star at the unknown optimizer. That's what it's supposed to be. If it is that, I mean, if we knew this magical quantity, we would never need to evolve H at all. And we can just run this method. And this method will never need to communicate if you apply it to the consensus reformulation of federated learning. So this would be a magical method, which has uh, you know, zero communication complexity, right? If this magical information H star was available. The problem is, the catch is, it's not. So HT is simply just a way of learning H star. So that's one way to explain a question, but I'm pretty sure there's not the explanation you were looking for. Maybe you are looking for a different explanation. So a different type of explanation could be, uh, this is in some sense a prima dual method, but then it's in this proxy paper, we didn't quite appreciate that fact. Once you look at the random prox paper that we wrote with Lohan Konda, you would see that uh, Proxkip is uh, related to uh, the prima dual Davisian splitting method, which we didn't know at the time when we discovered this. So you can think of it as a random, very particular randomized version of PDDY. Okay, that's a very different kind of intuition. And I even have a few slides on this. And if we have time, and if, if you stick around and you want, as I promised, if you want to have the answer, I'll show you exactly how that happens. Um, so these are maybe two answers. Does this satisfy you at this moment? Yeah, and uh, the second question is uh, similar to the question that is asked in the chat about the initialization and the estimation of it. Right, so the initialization could be absolutely anything. You can start with any H0, just like you can start the learning process with any X0. You can really think of these as any initial estimates that you have. That's it. Now you could set H0 to be the gradient of F at X0 if you wish, but this could be really arbitrary uh, point HT. And uh, I can answer this by, by on this slide, uh, when I show you what the theorem looks like. So here it'll be answered a little bit. So the theorem for Proxkip looks like this. Uh, and I'm trying to copy exactly the theorem for proximal uh, gradient descent. So if the number of iterations is at least condition number times log one of epsilon, that's what we had for proximal gradient descent. Now we have one change. And the changes is not just L over mu times log one, log one over epsilon, but is the maximum of L over mu and one over P squared. And P is the probability of uh, communicating. That's the probability of evaluating the proximity operator. So if you take this many of iterations, uh, then certainly up on a function will be below epsilon times its original value. Now, what is this up on a function? It's a, a sum of what we had before, just distance of xt from the solution and distance of hd from h star, which was this optimal h that I was motivating the method uh, from. Uh, so you could you could see that uh, hd could have any initial value, it could be h0, any, 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 any value whatsoever. But if you start with a value that's closer to h star, then the Lyapunov the function should be smaller and this should work better. Uh, but uh, any h0 is allowed, any x0 is allowed. Great, thank you. Okay, and now if you stare at this theorem, you may ask the following question. Okay, how do I get proximal gradient ascent out of this theorem as a special case? Well, you get it by choosing P to be one, right? Because if you choose P to be one, then prox skip will just become proximal gradient ascent method because you never skip the prox. You always evaluate it. Uh, and uh, then you also get the rate L over mu times log one of epsilon. Yes, you get some uh, Lyapunov function here. We can ignore it a little bit, but uh, the number of iterations will be the same. But you can immediately see that that's a suboptimal choice for the probability. 
because what if L over mu is 10 trillion and you choose probability one, then you have maximum of 10 trillion and one. It doesn't look like a very balanced maximum, right? You should choose this probability to be so small that 10 trillion is going to be equal to one over P squared, right? Because that will not affect the number of iterations. In other words, the optimal way of choosing P is so that the second term, one over P squared is exactly equal to L over mu. And when you choose such a small p, this will not affect the number of iterations. It's still L over mu times log one or epsilon. However, in this way, you maximize the number of proc skips you're going to do. Or you, in other words, you minimize the number of proximal evaluations you're going to do. And that turns out to be the formula for p in proc skip, the optimal one. So p should be exactly uh, one over square root of condition number. In this way, by choosing that p, these two values will be the same. So that's so uh, that's underlying the discovery behind Proxkip, the realization that uh, you shouldn't evaluate the proximity operator every time in proximal gradient descent because it's an overkill. Uh, it's not needed every time. You can skip most of them and be fine. The number of iterations will not change. So this is useful whenever the evaluation of the proximity operator is expensive compared to the evaluation of the gradient of f not necessarily just in federal learning setting. In federal learning setting, evaluation of the proximity operator is expensive compared to the evaluation of the gradient because it involves communication. But you can imagine situations where you want to do projected gradient ascent, but projecting is very expensive. So proxy could be used there too. That's outside of uh, federal learning. So, so here, the moral of the story here is that somehow in order to solve this problem in fair learning of what local training really does and why does it help the training process, we had to solve a more general problem of accelerating proximal gradient ascent by skipping the props. Okay, now I can skip few of these slides because I said all of this. I can only say that what I want to add here is that we can generalize from working with gradients to working with stochastic gradients, we can work on arbitrary connected network and so on and so forth. This uh, skipping procs is somehow philosophically related to the literature of George Lan on gradient sliding. However, he doesn't skip the procs, he skips gradient evaluation and skips it in a different way, but philosophically it's, it's, it's a similar idea. So you, you want to minimize some of functions and one of them is more expensive one than the other and you want to you want to cheat on that, uh, except in George Land's work, he was cheating on a different type of function, not exactly on this. All right, so I can see still the audience is strong, not as strong as initially, but still very, very strong. So now the question is, I only have this part five on random procs, few slides, a connection to, uh, to primal dual methods and, uh, and splitting algorithms. And, and then I have only that one slide on, on, on the grad skip, which I already told you about, which I don't have to come back to. So if you have any questions at this point, I'll take questions. And if and once I get one or two questions, I move to this part and this is just a few slides and then it's gonna be over. So any questions possibly? Um, why don't we just skip the, the prox um, determinist rather than using a probability? Right. <clears throat> so that's excellent question, Dinesh. Um, so that's, in fact, what is done in the scuff old algorithm. So I had this slide here. Uh, let me see. Where is it? This slide, right? So there's this scuff old algorithm, which is generation four algorithm. And we call our algorithm scuff new because it's very similar to the scaffold algorithm. Uh, so that's why when we apply proxkip to the, to the consensus reformulation of early learning, we call it scaffold. So that's concrete instantiation of proxkip. And the key difference between these two methods, if you look at that carefully, which we didn't, which we realized only after we wrote the paper later, is key difference is that scaffold takes deterministic many local steps, local training steps, and scaff new randomly, many. Uh, so that's really the key difference between the two methods. Uh, and now, but now you can see that if you run scaffold, 
with the optimal number of local training steps, the performance is almost identical to Skafnia, right? And this tells you that it doesn't really matter in practice whether you have randomly many steps or not. But at the moment, it matters in the theory because it simplifies the theory so much to have randomly many local training steps that we can actually show the accelerated nature of the method. And with the non-randomly many local training steps, we cannot do it. And at the moment, that's an open problem to show that scaffold also is a fifth generation local training method. So that's the answer, right? So it doesn't, it shouldn't matter in practice, but it matters in theory at the moment. Having said that, I was also talking about these other methods here, and some of them do not take uh, uh, do not take randomly many local training steps, but deterministically many local training steps. For instance, 5GCS doesn't have to randomize for the number of local training steps. There's a formula for you know, this many local training steps is deterministic formula. Uh, so, but most of these methods actually need to randomize. So 5GCS is an, is an exception. Here. So it's not really, it's, it's not a fundamental thing. It just simplifies things a lot. And in general, randomized algorithms have this double benefit that they are easily analyzable uh, than non randomized counterparts. So, for instance, SGD is more easily analyzable than incremental gradient descent, which is the same method. They only differ in the order through which you go through the gradients is stochastic and the other it's cyclic. And, and you, you would see this throughout the literature that whenever you can randomize something, almost whenever you get a simpler analysis. And very often the randomized version is also better in practice. So you get this double advantage. Okay, did I answer your question? You, you did answer, yes, thanks. Okay, very good. Is there any other one question? Okay, so- Yes, yeah, so, excuse me. Yeah, there also a the number of epochs that the clients are supposed to uh, use to update the models or how do you decide it? Because you said it's randomized, so- you communicate the number of steps the client is supposed to make, right? E, e, well, you can implement it in multiple ways. So, so this probability, so with this probability, you communicate. And it's the same probability for everybody. So one way you can think of this is that before every training, after every communication, after, the master can actually do all of these conflicts on his own because these conflicts are completely independent of everything. So the master can do the conflicts and just tell the, all the clients that, guys, you're, now you're taking 10,005 iterations, local training steps. And, and after that, they all communicate. And then the master again simulates these conflicts and then say, OK, this time it's just 900 local training steps. And this is completely cheap because just extra one number that is communicated besides the, the model, right? So it's very, very easy to implement this. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, good. So now I can finally get to this random prox interpretation of proxkip. That's one way how we can think of this. Another way how we can think of this, that this is a massive generalization of proxkip. So let me see whether Lohan is still around. Lohan already left, so he's the co-author on this paper. So he won't be here to correct me, which is great. <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, right. So, so now we want to solve a very different problem because this paper is not about fair learning. This paper is about something else, but it turns out to be a discovery that Proxkip is a special case of this method, which we develop here. So here we want to minimize some of three functions. One that is smooth, just like before, the F. One which is non-smooth and proximable, just like before, and another one which is non-smooth and proximable. And the way you should think of this, that before we only had f, and we only had this red function h, and the green function was just zero. It doesn't, didn't exist there at all. And k was identity. Okay, so, so the previous setup of minimizing f plus psi was g is not there, h is psi, 
and k is identity so this is not a matrix just identity matrix here okay so so if you want to uh, solve a problem of this type it turns out you can solve it with you know several methods one of them uh, is a method by Adil, Salim, Laurent, Constantine, and myself called the Prima Du Davisian splitting method. So heavily influenced by the Davisian splitting method. And, and I, I don't want to go too much into detail of the method. It only has three steps, but I want to highlight uh, uh, four facts. Fact number one, you evaluate the gradient of the blue function f because that's different, that's a smooth function. Fact number two, you evaluate the procs of the green function, and that's the only way you interact with the green function. Fact number three, you evaluate the procs of the red function. Okay, I have the star here, don't worry about it, because proximity operator of the convex conjugate and the original one, they add up to you know something. So if you can compute the procs of one, you can always compute the procs of the other. So this is something like the same as evaluating the proximity operator of H. So you evaluate the proximity of the red function and you can do uh, matrix vector multiplications with the matrix K. So K transpose or K. So the PDDY method uh, from a distance in the bird's eye view, the way you should think of it is a method for minimizing some of these three functions by evaluating gradient of F, proximity operator of G, proximity operator of H, and you need to be able to multiply by K and its transpose. That's it. If you are able to do those four things, you can minimize the sum of these three functions. Okay. Now, this method turns out to be very, very general method. And depending on these four quantities, F, G, H, and K, this method actually turns out to be equivalent to many methods known in the literature. So for instance, uh, if, let me go to forward backward. So if G is zero and K is identity, as I was saying, then this method turns out to be forward backward splitting method, which is exactly the proximal gradient descent method. You evaluate the gradient of F and then the prox of H and repeat. So you can think of this method as a generalization of the proximal gradient descent method to the case where the proximity operator is composed also with some linear operator. And when you have additional thing here of which you can take proximity operator. Uh, however, if you let's say uh, choose F to be zero, so you don't have any smooth function there, you have just these two non-smooth functions, G and H, and K, the uh, matrix happens to be identity. This is the ADMM method, the, the famous ADMM method and so on and so forth. So you can get Davis in algorithm by choosing K to be identity. So our primal Davis in splitting kind of generalizes it to K being any matrix. You can get shambhal pog algorithm by choosing G, H, and K to be anything, but F is zero and so on and so forth. So by learning this one method, you immediately learn already one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other algorithms by choosing F, G, H, K uh, in a specific way. Okay, so there's the PDDY algorithm. And now, uh, okay, I should probably also say a little bit. So ADMM was uh, popularized by Steve Boyd and, and Carters in their book, uh, 2011. Uh, Davisian is due to Davisian. Uh, the PAPC algorithm is due to Drury, sub and so on and so forth. Okay, so what do we do in random procs? In random procs, we change the PTDY method very slightly. And what we do, we look at this yellow row so this update involving the proximity operator of the red function, and we uh, apply a randomized compression operator RT to the proximity operator. Okay, so there's a literature on compressed gradient methods where you have quantization operators or sparsification operators such as random K and so on. And we do exactly that here except we don't apply the compression operator to gradient, we apply the compression operator to the proximity operator. But because the compression operator introduces randomness, otherwise this method would not be random at all. Everything is deterministic in this method, except for this RT. As soon as we introduce randomness, the randomness causes, well, noise, randomness is noise, and that just destroys the method somehow. Just like you destroy gradient descent by uh, introducing randomness and doing stochastic gradient, or you destroy gradient descent if you start doing coordinate descent, randomized coordinate descent. So you introduce randomness and something gets destroyed. 
And this minus ut here and plus ut outside is supposed to correct for the randomness. So this is a variance reduction technique for removing the variance introduced by this compression operator. This variance reduction technique is called error feedback 21, or it's also very similar to the Diana uh, error feedback mechanism. So those are the two changes. So you throw in a randomized compression operator, but you need to subtract ut and add ut. And you need to also divide by one plus omega and here multiply this step size by one plus omega and omega is a, a variance parameter associated with the compression operator. So the compression operator is unbiased and it has bounded variance uh, in this clinical manner. So here I would pause again, because I'm sure uh, you would have at least uh, some questions. And I'm already really getting to the end. So while you're thinking about questions, the big reveal is that Proxkip arises by choosing a very particular compression operator here, which is the so-called Bernoulli compressor. And Bernoulli compressor, it flips a coin, and with some probability, it outputs the input. And with some other probability, it just outputs zero. So RT, the result of RT would just be this thing in the argument, or it'd be zero. If it's zero, then UT plus one is just UT is not updated. And this UT will be the shift that you have seen before in Proxkip. And if uh, uh, RT is uh, identity with some probability, then somehow these UTs will cancel out and you just get the proximity uh, evaluation uh, and you get the standard uh, uh, step. So this is a generalization of Proxkip in several ways. So one way is that you allow for the matrix K and the green function G. So those are two changes. And the third change, you replace the random coin flip by arbitrary compression operator. So in these three ways, this is a generalization of Proskip, but you could also think of it as a particular randomization of the primal dual Davisian splitting algorithm. At the moment when we develop Proskip algorithm, we're not aware of this, even though the PDDY algorithm is algorithm that we developed uh, in, in previous uh, paper. So somehow these intuitions that led us here were different, and we only later realized that this was the case. Now, that's it. That's all. After this, I have this part six grad skip, and I already told you this, and I have this final slide at the end. So I will just stop here and maybe take one or two questions, and then I'll just thank everybody for their patience with me. This was a long talk, but I wanted to go through all two. All, all of this, even though I would lose some audience because I thought it could be good for maybe the online uh, audience. To, Peter, to I give. have one question, Alexander, here. Yes. So I miss here. So we, we are working with high dimensional functions. We approximate these functions by low rank tensors uh, and so on. And all our results depends on dimension D. We, in our notation, it's D. Convergence speed and... Uh, complexity here i miss it somehow okay so 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 your question is even about the proskip method right so it's even about this right yeah no yeah general it even applies here okay well dimensionality here it's it doesn't appear explicitly anywhere but it appears implicitly so for instance if you look at this distance what is distance well, you have to go through all the coordinates and sum up all the differences squared, right? So you, you actually have, this is a sum over all the dimensions. So dimensionality is already hidden in the Lyapunov function, for instance, right? So that's one place. Uh, another place could be, uh, I'm assuming that these uh, uh, smoothness and strong convexity constants are constants, but if you have a sequence of problems where the dimension keeps growing, Nobody says that these uh, smoothness and strong convergence constants will not change, right? Because you just have a different problem. If, if you increase dimension, you don't have the same function, right? That means you have a different function. So there could be a dependence on dimension in L and mu, 
could be. But it also, it doesn't have to be, right? Because you can have a trillion dimensional matrix whose condition number doesn't depend on the dimension. It's possible, right, to have such a matrix. And in that sense, L over mu would not depend on dimension, but it also could depend on the dimension and even very badly. So it really depends on the conditioning. So that's why the dependence is really implicit here. And there is one more dependence on dimension, which is that whenever you communicate in Proxkip, so here's the method, whenever you communicate, maybe I describe it at this level, whenever you communicate, whenever, which means you evaluate the proximity operator, then all the clients have to send to the master a d-dimensional vector. So it doesn't, dimensionality would not then influence a uh, number of iterations, but it influence the cost of each iteration because you actually send d-dimensional vector. And if you have a larger d, it will be more costly. This is also the reason why in this table, it's very useful. So in this table, let me, let me find it. Well, in this table, we have methods which also do communication compression. So there's this compressed Kafnu and Tamuna. So they exactly try to uh, tackle the dimensionality aspect of things, uh, which is when you communicate these d-dimensional vectors, maybe you replace the d-dimensional vector just by low rank approximation of that vector or by some other approximation. So very lossy approximation, low dimensional approximation. And it turns out you can do it and you can still retain the theoretical communication acceleration. And in fact, if you do the compression right, you get even a better method. Even the theory is better if you do the compression right. So I hope I touched on dimensionality uh, uh, in the way that you expected. Yes, thank you very much. Ajit, could you ask your question aloud? Yeah, I was just wondering when you mentioned about RT uh, by using Bernoulli distribution for 0 and 1. Uh, so I was just thinking if uh, if I get it correct, can we try any other distribution or uh, that kind of instead of Bernoulli? Right. So, so in this Could random box... to digest, so maybe I have missed the trick. <laughs> yes. It, yes. I talk about multiple papers, so it is expected. It's the last but... one, the pro. Rock yeah. experience where we were yeah. talking about RT. So, here, yeah, so yeah. here in theory, you could apply absolutely any uh, uh, operator which has these two properties. I mean, any mapping which has these two properties yeah. uh, and not just Burnley one. Now, what other mappings have such properties? If you look at this paper, we get several examples and some of the examples uh, look like this. Imagine that even this function H here, is a sum of functions, okay? Just like F could be sum of functions because you have lots of data or and clients, right? Even the non-smooth function could be sum of non-smooth functions. In that case, uh, this randomization could actually be that you only pick one of these functions that define H and you evaluate the prox only of that one and not of the others. So this randomization could actually represent something like SGD so you subsample from a sum, but not of smooth functions, but of non-smooth functions. So instead of having that interpretation, the Bernoulli one, you can have this interpretation. So this step could even be thought of as some sort of SGD type method for minimizing sum of non-smooth functions. But if you have non-smooth functions, you cannot work with stochastic gradients because gradients don't exist. But instead, what you work with is with proximity operators of those functions. They replace the gradient operator of those functions. So this would be the right type of a SGD-like method for minimizing sum or average of non-smooth functions. So that's, that's something else. You could also think of some more elaborate operators, but uh, at least keep these two in mind. So this could mean subsampling, and it could also mean this Bernoulli thing. The Bernoulli thing has very particular application feathered learning. The subsampling would just be the same application as subsampling or mini batching has in standard machine learning, except the added benefit is it works even if the function are not smooth. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, still there is a question. Sunny, feel free to ask. 
Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for this amazing lecture. Uh, I'm asking, is there any uh, practical implementation of Proxkip uh, so far? Right. So in all of these papers, we implemented the method and played with it. Uh, however, may maybe an interesting example that uh, maybe you're trying to search for is there is a company which was started uh, late last year called Together uh, by some people from Stanford and ETH and so on. And what they do, they train large language models and they train them in a distributed manner. In fact, they do fine tuning as far as I understand, but they do it in a massively distributed or federated manner over even multiple continents. And uh, they actually used uh, this Proxkip algorithm as one part of their training routine to do that. So, so it's, it's, it's really useful in practice too. But they didn't use just the Proxkip algorithm in a pure manner, they had to do a few other things as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and Ajit is pointing to a GitHub of, uh, of Proxkip. So yes, we have our own implementation and so on. Uh, anybody can play with these algorithms. They are on GitHub, but they're also very simple algorithms and you can implement them quite easily on your own if you if you wish. Okay, so thanks everybody for sticking around for so long and for asking all these fantastic questions and have nice uh, rest of the day. Bye-bye everyone.